For generations, our world has challenged explorers to seek what lies beyond the horizon. Now, the invention of spaceflight is leading us outward to explore a host of alien worlds with vast new territories. Today, we see the sun, moon, and planets with penetrating clarity through the eyes of the intrepid machines blazing a trail for us across the solar system. Their cameras have become our windows onto a bold new adventure. Their discoveries have become our cosmic vistas. There are more than 100 moons in our solar system. The vast majority of them orbit the two largest planets, Jupiter and Saturn. Collectively, they run the gamut from small to large, cold to hot, and quiet to active. Could it be that somewhere in that range of possibilities, we will find a hidden haven for alien life? Most of the moons that orbit Jupiter and Saturn are quite small, but a few are so large and complex they could easily be considered planets. For more than 300 years, there was almost nothing astronomers could say about these intriguing places. Thanks to spaceflight, that's no longer the case. In 1979, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 sailed past Jupiter's four largest moons with their cameras rolling. The pictures they radioed back reveal that each moon has its own distinct character and a range of features unlike anything seen before. The biggest surprise of all was Io, the innermost of the four moons. Its rocky surface is a mottled and sulfurous mess. Unlike our moon, there are no craters on Io. It's as though they are being erased by some mysterious agent. The explanation came when Voyager 1 spied something unusual protruding 300 kilometers from one side of Io. It was a fountain of ash spewing from a large volcano. Since that discovery, it's now become clear Io is the most geologically active world in the solar system. Io's surface is one vast lava flow with more than a dozen active volcanoes towering over the sulfur-rich landscape. The gravitational pull of Jupiter and some of its other large moons creates a tug of war inside Io, which generates vast amounts of heat. While this makes for a dynamic surface, it is not particularly hospitable to life. Jupiter's outermost large moon, Callisto, couldn't be more different. Callisto's battered face is saturated with ancient impact craters, suggesting not much has happened here since Callisto formed. But looks can be deceiving. The most recent data suggest there could be a zone of salty water 
somewhere deep below Callisto's surface of ice and rock. Whether life could survive in such a hidden environment remains an open question. Meanwhile, on Ganymede, we find more obvious signs of a geologically active past. Ganymede is the largest moon in our solar system and one of the strangest looking. Part of its surface is as old as Callisto's, dark and heavily cratered. But the dark areas are fractured by a more recent terrain made up of parallel grooves and ridges. Exactly how these grooves and ridges formed is still a big mystery. It is clear Ganymede has a warmer interior than Callisto. In the past, that warmth may have risen up through Ganymede's interior and forced sections of its surface to drift apart, just like the continents on Earth. Because of its heat, Ganymede's interior has likely separated into layers, starting with an iron-rich core at the center, a surrounding mantle of rock, and a thick layer of ice on top of that. As with Callisto, there is evidence on Ganymede for an ocean of salt water somewhere below the surface. This is exciting news because the right combination of heat and water may provide the conditions necessary for life on Ganymede. Such life forms would be cut off from the sun and the surface environment. But like the creatures that live around deep sea vents in Earth's oceans, it might survive on chemical energy. This tantalizing possibility won't be tested anytime soon. If Ganymede has an ocean, it's at least 200 kilometers below its frozen surface. A better opportunity for exploring the ocean of another world may exist on Europa. At first glance, Europa seems like the least interesting of Jupiter's moons because its surface is so flat and smooth. Its lack of dramatic relief, like mountains or large craters, might be an indication that water isn't far below. Europa is crisscrossed with a network of cracks that suggest its icy crust has opened up from time to time letting a watery slush spill out onto the surface. In one area, scientists have found what appear to be icebergs that cracked and floated apart like rafts before the surface refroze. Some of the cracks on Europa have a darker and more reddish hue than the rest of the surface ice. This could mean that the underlying ocean is rich in sulfur compounds and perhaps organic molecules. Indications are that in some places, this ocean may be less than 10 kilometers from the surface, possibly within reach of a future attempt to drill down and explore the marine environment of another world. Today, Europa's ocean is high on the list of locations where scientists are eager to search for alien life. The surfaces of Jupiter's moons may conceal many mysteries. But on Saturn's giant moon, Titan, even the surface is hidden from view. Titan is the only moon in our solar system with a substantial atmosphere, and it shows. When Voyager 1 arrived at Saturn in 1980, 
it found Titan shrouded by a thick orange haze. This haze is like a photochemical smog produced when sunlight reacts with methane in Titan's atmosphere. It would be a full generation before scientists had their next chance at Titan. When the Cassini mission arrived at Saturn in 2004, it used a high-powered camera equipped with an infrared filter to penetrate the veil of Titan's thick haze. What Cassini found was even stranger than expected, a surface divided into mysterious light and dark regions resembling ancient coastlines. Cassini also bounced radar signals off of Titan, confirming that the moon's surface is solid with unusual landforms like ice volcanoes and wind-blown dunes. After several more passes of Titan, Cassini's radar made an even more exciting discovery, a series of dark patches that were perfectly flat, resembling the surfaces of small lakes. Scientists were eager for more direct evidence of potential fluid flow on Titan. They found it in dramatic fashion when Cassini dropped a probe into Titan's cloudy atmosphere. After the probe deployed its parachute and slowly descended, it radioed pictures back to Cassini. As soon as the probe emerged from the clouds, it began to see exciting details that looked suspiciously like they had been carved by a flowing liquid. Then, to everyone's surprise, the probe survived its impact and sent back one final spectacular image. It showed chunks of ice clearly rounded by fluid flow like rocks in a stream bed on Earth. On Titan, it's so cold that water is like rock, but methane, which is a gas here on Earth, can rain down from Titan's atmosphere and flow as a liquid over the surface. Methane is a building block for the kinds of complex molecules that led to the emergence of life on Earth. And that means if Titan has an internal heat source, like some of Jupiter's moons, it could also be harboring its own ecosystem deep below the surface. One thing is clear, Titan and Jupiter's moons are no longer sideshows to the planets they orbit. Together, they have become the main motivators in our exploration of the outer solar system. Here on planet Earth, it's easy to take water for granted. Water covers 70% of Earth's surface, and its presence is essential for life as we know it. Farther away, in the dim reaches of the outer solar system, water plays a different role. Around Saturn, water is everywhere. With temperatures near minus 180 degrees Celsius, it's far too cold for water to exist in a liquid state. Here, water remains frozen solid, so solid that it doesn't just cover worlds, it makes worlds.
When we get to Saturn, we discover ice is the main ingredient in building moons. In fact, Saturn is surrounded by an entire family of icy moons that the Cassini mission has now revealed in spectacular detail. By exploring these frozen worlds, scientists hope to reveal an ancient story, not just about Saturn, but about the entire outer solar system. This is certainly the case with Phoebe, the first of Saturn's moons that Cassini encountered up close. Just 200 kilometers across, Phoebe is too small and its gravity too weak to pull itself into a sphere. When Cassini sailed past Phoebe, it found a surface rich in carbon, with deep craters exposing layers of bright white ice lying just below. Overall, Phoebe is darker and contains more rock than Saturn's other icy moons. This suggests it did not form near Saturn, but in the Kuiper Belt beyond Neptune. The objects inhabiting this zone are ancient, the original building blocks of the outer solar system. It now appears Phoebe is an escapee from that region and only later captured by Saturn and turned into a moon. This moon is giving us a sneak preview of what we'll find at much further distances from the Sun. Four times closer to Saturn and four times larger than Phoebe, Iapetus is a very different kind of moon. It is 80% ice, but its most distinctive feature is its strange two-tone shading. While one side of Iapetus is extremely dark, the other is whitish gray. This color difference also corresponds to a significant temperature difference. On average, the dark side is 15 degrees warmer than the light side. Scientists now suspect that dark material possibly blasted from the surface of Phoebe, may have fallen down onto Iapetus long ago. The side that received the dust absorbed more of the sun's energy, and the ice there began to sublimate, leaving behind grains of dust and rock that would darken the surface even further. Meanwhile, the vaporized ice resettled onto the other side of Iapetus and around its poles, creating the look it has today. Even stranger is a long ridge Cassini discovered running along the equator of Iapetus, giving it the appearance of a walnut. In places, the ridge is 13 kilometers high. The forces that created this bizarre feature are not well understood, but it likely happened when Iapetus was spinning more rapidly than it is now and had more internal heat shaping its surface. Moving even closer towards Saturn, we find Hyperion, a misshapen object with a strange honeycombed surface. Hyperion is so irregular in shape and appearance, it is probably just a fragment from a larger moon that was destroyed in a collision. It may not even be solid, but a loosely packed pile of rubble. Measurements by Cassini reveal Hyperion is more than 40% empty space. Signs of ancient collisions are visible everywhere on Saturn's moons, including Rhea, Dione, and Tethys. At first glance, this trio of round moons could be mistaken for identical triplets. Each one is more than 1,000 kilometers across and carpeted with impact craters from billions of years ago. 
but they are also variations on a theme. Each of the three has its own distinct features, suggesting a more complex and diverse history. For example, this giant canyon called Ithaca Chasma wraps around Tethys like a waistband. It may have formed long ago when the icy interior of Tethys froze and expanded, forcing its crust to stretch apart at the seams. Looking at Dione from afar, scientists long wondered about a series of wispy white lines running across its surface. Now Cassini has revealed the lines are the bright faces of steep cliffs formed when Dione was repeatedly fractured by internal forces. But the biggest surprise came from Rhea. Cassini found indirect evidence this moon is surrounded by a dark, dusty ring, making Rhea the only moon anywhere in the solar system with a ring of its own. While most of Saturn's icy moons were likely once geologically active worlds, which later cooled and grew dormant, at least one seems to have forgotten to fall asleep. And the implications are enormous. Enceladus is only 500 kilometers across. Under ordinary circumstances, an object of this size should be too small to retain heat for billions of years. But Enceladus is nowhere near ordinary. Here Cassini spotted vast geysers of water vapor shooting outward from a region near its south pole. The vapor carries fine grains of dust, which escape into space and form a diffuse ring along Enceladus's orbital path around Saturn. Looking down at the surface for clues, Cassini has revealed a strange and puzzling sight. Enceladus is scored with long, deep gouges, nicknamed tiger stripes, from which the geysers are thought to emanate. The stripes are surrounded by fresh ice, which suggests that somewhere below the surface, temperatures are high enough to melt ice and hold liquid water under pressure before venting it into space like a tea kettle. No one yet knows exactly how Enceladus does this. One important clue from Cassini is that Enceladus has more rock and metal than many other of Saturn's moons, and so perhaps it is being warmed by a combination of radioactive heating from within and strong tides produced by Saturn and its other moons. Even more exciting is the presence of organic molecules near the tiger stripes. When this is combined with the likelihood of liquid water, it appears Enceladus may have all the ingredients necessary for life. For a tiny moon at the leading edge of the icy solar system, this is an astonishing revelation. To call the icy moons of Saturn strange is an understatement. These odd little worlds are utterly unlike Earth but understanding how they formed and evolved is an important goal for scientists. Why? Because if there are so many icy moons in our solar system, there must be countless others out there among the stars. Whenever one of those moons is warmed up enough to melt the ice into water, there exists at least the potential for life and perhaps our best chance to answer the age-old question, are we alone?
For generations, our world has challenged explorers to seek what lies beyond the horizon. Now, the invention of spaceflight is leading us outward to explore a host of alien worlds with vast new territories. Today, we see the sun, moon, and planets with penetrating clarity through the eyes of the intrepid machines blazing a trail for us across the solar system. Their cameras have become our windows onto a bold new adventure. Their discoveries have become our cosmic vistas. Once, it seemed the space between Earth and the stars was empty, except for the moon and a few planets. Once, it seemed the solar system was a benign place where life, once established, could develop in peace. Once, it seemed we would only ever be able to touch distant worlds by going there. But now we know, sometimes those worlds come to us with devastating results. Earth is by no means alone. The vast corridor of Earth's orbit around the sun is also crisscrossed by asteroids of varying size. The largest asteroid of all is Ceres. At nearly 1,000 kilometers across, Ceres is just big enough for the Hubble Space Telescope to see its rotation and make out a few blurry surface features. Ceres is no threat to Earth. Like hundreds of thousands of other asteroids, it is safely confined to the asteroid belt. This zone between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter is full of rocky debris left over from the birth of our solar system. But sometimes, even the slightest gravitational nudge can send asteroids drifting out of the belt directly across Earth's path. But asteroids are not the only hazards we have to worry about. Comets can be seen coursing through the solar system like guided missiles, trailing brilliant tails of dust and gas behind them. Although they are made of ice and frozen gases rather than rock, comets move so fast that a direct hit from one could release even more destructive energy than an asteroid strike. This was vividly demonstrated in 1994, when comet Shoemaker-Levy 9, after breaking up into several pieces, slammed into the atmosphere of Jupiter. It gave the solar system's largest planet a series of black eyes so large they could easily be seen by the Hubble Space Telescope orbiting Earth. For centuries, astronomers thought of the solar system as an orderly place where the planets, including Earth, quietly went about their business. Today, we realize the solar system is really more of a cosmic shooting gallery full of asteroids and comets that could threaten life on Earth. That's why exploring these objects is not just a quest for science, but a question of survival. Today, we can still find scars where violent collisions rattled our planet long ago. 
on Earth, wind, water, and glaciers have erased most of the evidence of ancient craters. Not so on the moon. Here we find a surface almost entirely covered in craters, preserving the record of a violent bombardment that has accumulated over billions of years. One of the most prominent and recent lunar craters is Tycho, which formed about 100 million years ago. At that time, scientists suspected a collision in the asteroid belt may have sent a wave of rocky debris heading our way. One piece hit the moon, forming Tycho. Another piece struck Earth, wiping out the dinosaurs and changing the history of life on our planet forever. Our first real look at the asteroid belt did not come until the 1990s, when the NASA Galileo spacecraft made close passes of two asteroids on its way to Jupiter. The first, named Gaspra, is only 18 kilometers long. In contrast, the asteroid Ida is over three times larger, and it came with an extra surprise, a miniature asteroid orbiting around it like a moon. These early glimpses set the stage for the first dedicated mission to visit an asteroid. Eros is 35 kilometers long and one of the largest Earth approaching asteroids. And though it is not currently on a collision course with Earth, it presents the perfect opportunity to study up close the kind of asteroid that could one day pose a threat. Unlike a planet, which has uniform gravity at all points on its surface, the irregular shape of Eros means its gravity varies greatly from point to point. It is also spinning rapidly, tumbling through space. Orbiting such an object is no small feat. Despite this formidable challenge, NASA's near Shoemaker spacecraft made detailed maps of the surface of Eros and measured its mineral composition. It found Eros is loaded with rock and metal with a density similar to Earth's crust. As the mission neared its end, controllers brought the spacecraft closer and closer, expecting it to eventually crash land onto Eros. To their astonishment, the spacecraft survived the landing and managed to transmit images of its final descent to the surface. Getting a spacecraft to reach out and touch an asteroid is a tall order, but doing the same with a comet is an even taller one. Comets originate in the distant outskirts of the solar system in a region called the Oort Cloud, well beyond the reach of any spacecraft or telescope. Occasionally, does a comet sweep into the inner solar system, where the sun's heat warms its icy surface, forcing it to spew vast amounts of gas and dust. In 2004, the Stardust spacecraft took a perilous journey to comet Vilt 2 to see it up close and capture a few particles streaming from its surface. Stardust showed us a tiny world, utterly different from anything seen before in the solar system. It is riddled with circular depressions, 
resembling craters, but with steep walls where gas could be venting into space. Quite a trail. Near spec has a great view. Dave on the ground. Stardust eventually traveled back to Earth with a capsule containing samples of the comet's dust. Some of the dust grains appeared to predate the solar system itself. If so, they offer a direct window into the ancient nebula that created the sun, planets, and all life on Earth. Meanwhile, the Deep Impact mission took a different approach. Before arriving at Comet Temple 1, the spacecraft split into two pieces. One piece headed straight for the comet, smashing into its nucleus and raising a plume of material into space. The other part flew by to witness the event and analyze the pristine material ejected by the sudden explosion. Coated in a fine dusty powder, the comet's icy interior is rich in organic compounds, precisely the kind of matter that may have once jump-started life on Earth. There is an irony in these results. Our interest in comets and asteroids is motivated partly by the danger they pose to life on Earth. But it's quite possible that without comets and asteroids and the organic materials they bring, life might not have even started here in the first place. Like the planets, the comets and asteroids are unique and teach us something about our own place in the universe. That's the upside to living in a shooting gallery. It may be a bit scary out there, but it's never dull. For explorers in search of all that is strange and different, our solar system holds many rewards. In its sweeping vistas, the cosmos supplies unending variety. Rendered from the most basic ingredients, ice, metal, gas, and rock. The planets and moons have become nature's laboratory, where over billions of years, the laws of physics and chemistry have yielded masterpieces of astonishing complexity and beauty. It inspires the imagination, leading us to wonder if all we have seen so far could be repeated again and again in countless solar systems across the universe. Once astronomers realized the sun is just one star among billions and the Earth just one planet, it was natural to assume other worlds existed beyond our solar system. But finding those worlds is a technical challenge of the highest order and it has taken nearly four centuries since the invention of the telescope to do it. In fact, the first concrete evidence other planets exist didn't come from finding the planets themselves, but from finding the places where planets are born. 
Peering across 1,500 light years, the Hubble Space Telescope zooms in on the Orion Nebula. It is a giant stellar nursery where stars are forming by the thousands. The brightest shine with an intensity greater than 200,000 suns, lighting up hydrogen and other gases, producing a dazzling and colorful spectacle. But deep in the nebula, Hubble can also see what earlier telescopes could not. These tiny, tadpole-like shapes are infant solar systems under construction. Some look dark in contrast to the glow of the surrounding nebula. That means they contain dust as well as gas. It is in these dusty cocoons where planets are most likely to form. If it's happening there, then it is easy to imagine the same thing going on throughout the universe. If so, there must be countless solar systems out there waiting to be discovered. Using a device called a coronagraph, Hubble can block the bright light of a nearby star to probe the space immediately around it. In some cases, this has allowed the space telescope to spy the faint reflected light coming from a disk of dusty debris that surrounds the star. Some disks are seen face on, others edge on. Their presence is another favorable sign for planet hunters because the dust they contain is generated by the collisions of asteroids or comets orbiting around young stars. And where comets have formed, it's likely planets have formed too. When applying this method to the bright star Fomalhaut, Hubble finds not just a disk of dust, but a ring. The fact the region inside the ring is relatively dust-free may indicate most of it has gone into building planets. These views offer tantalizing hints that planets must exist around other stars. But pinpointing those planets more directly requires a different strategy. If a star has a planet orbiting around it, gravity will pull on the star, causing it to wobble back and forth. Although this wobble is slight, in some cases it can be measured from Earth, which tells astronomers where there are planets, how far they are orbiting, and how massive they could be. Once astronomers perfected this technique in the 1990s, they began to see evidence for planets around many nearby stars. The real surprise is how different these planets are from anything we know in our own solar system. Although most are comparable in size to Jupiter, many are also closer to the stars they orbit than Mercury is to our Sun. Astronomers have dubbed these new planets hot Jupiters. The discovery of hot Jupiters came as a complete surprise. Although astronomers expected other solar systems might be somewhat different than our own, no one imagined a difference so extreme. Despite all the variety we have uncovered in our own solar system, the range of possibilities beyond the solar system appears to be far greater. As technology has improved, so has our ability to detect signs of smaller planets. And now, for the first time, planets just a few times more massive than Earth are beginning to turn up. 
The best way to understand what these super-Earths are like is to catch one passing in front of the star it orbits, like a miniature eclipse. Because the planet blocks a small fraction of the star's light when this happens, it's possible to measure its size as well as its mass. This can tell astronomers whether the planet is dense, containing lots of rock and metal, or more like an ocean world with a thick layer of water or ice. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, engine start, 1, 0, and lift off of the Delta II rocket with Kepler on a search for planets in a subway like our own. To find Earth-sized planets like this, NASA has launched the Kepler spacecraft. Its mission is to stare at more than 100,000 stars for more than three years, waiting for their light to momentarily dim as planets cross in front. Some of those planets will be gas giants like Jupiter, but it's expected at least a few will be Earth-sized. By spotting these Earth-sized worlds, Kepler will be identifying the targets for future exploration by giant observatories in space. These follow-up missions will be vital, since they will probe the worlds that Kepler discovers for signs their atmospheres contain water or oxygen. This will help distinguish worlds like ours that may support life from worlds like Venus, which are similar in size and mass, but completely sterile. Working toward this goal, astronomers are now improving their ability to directly capture the light of distant planets with existing telescopes. And they have succeeded. Returning with the Hubble to look at Fomalhaut with its dusty ring, they have even spotted a planet there. It has moved over a two-year period, which confirms this tiny dot is not a background star, but a real planet. The planet is estimated to be no more than three times the mass of Jupiter, but it orbits Fomalhaut from a distance that is more than twice as far as Pluto from our Sun. This is not a planet where we expect to search for life, but with a distance of only 25 light years from Earth, it could be one of the nearest worlds to our own solar system, and perhaps the destination of a robotic mission centuries in the future. The number of planets that have been seen directly is growing fast. Meanwhile, more than 300 planets have been found indirectly, nearly 50 times the number in our own solar system. The last 15 years have seen a revolution in our ability to find and study planets beyond our solar system. The next 15 could be even more exciting as Kepler and its successors try to zero in on planets like Earth and then hunt for signs of life on those worlds. The glorious cosmic vistas we've been granted by our spacecraft explorers and orbiting telescopes carry a message. In a universe as vast and incredibly diverse as this, there are many possibilities for life but no guarantees. Until we find other civilizations like our own, we have no way of knowing how rare we are or what limitations there may be to our future in the galaxy. We stand on the threshold of a new age of exploration, perhaps the greatest in human history. Now, more than ever, 
we need to recognize the most astounding planet we've ever encountered in the universe is the one we call home.